I wasn't going out at night. Normally, I go out every night to a comedy club or a show in Los Angeles if I'm not on the road performing. So I, I said, you know what? I'm going to focus on building my social media platforms. So that is Facebook, Instagram, um, and YouTube, and TikTok. Uh, I say TikTok because that's the new one now. It's been out for over a year. But I think it's really kind of blown up since quarantine. Um, that platform has 800 million users uh, worldwide. Yeah, that's a lot. 800 million. That's okay. a lot. Um, and uh, I was like, you know, let's get it on the ground floor and see if we could build this. So at the beginning of the quarantine, I had like somewhere around 17,000 followers. And today I have 100,000. So that that was the goal. Build, build my platforms. And in doing so, I've built up all my other platforms. So, I'm, so that was the, that's essentially the goal. That and putting out, I've been putting out a video every Monday uh, on my YouTube channel and my Facebook uh, fan page. So every Monday I'd put a video out. I didn't put out a video this this week, and I, I don't know if I'm going to put out a video next week. I, I'm not, you know, given everything that's going on, I, I don't know if it's the right thing to do. I know people need to laugh right now, but, you know, we also don't want to be insensitive. We want to know that we're taking this issue seriously. So, um, you know, I wrote a new song or two. And uh, I haven't written a joke since quarantine, but I've been writing sketches and finding ways. I actually have a new character. He's a, he's an Italian chef, um, which people, I did a little fake commercial for him that people really, really liked. So I'm going to bring that character back, and I'm going to make a fake cooking show with him. Um, basically, the premise is, you know, he gets really horny. He likes to... When he cooks, he like it's like very sexual for him. And I think it's kind of funny because you, 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 know you know there's those chefs out there... They'll, they'll be like, mm, it's not, it is so good. It's a beautiful. Take this pasta home and I want to touch my body on the pasta. You know what I mean? So there's uh, there, there's definitely those types of chefs. So I, I wanted to um, do a character like that. So I'm just trying to find finding new ways to connect with people. I have been doing a lot of live sh stream shows. So doing shows on... Uh, so like um, Zoom, on YouTube, on uh, different platforms, on Instagram. It's definitely different, but I, I, I said at the beginning of the quarantine, I said, this is going to be the new normal for, for many months, so I better figure out how to do it. I learned how to live stream, as you could see, like like lighting and sound and how to make everything look good and sound good. It's just another skill we have in the bag, so... Take, taking this opportunity to just learn something new. So that's what I what that's what I kind of been up to. Well, you know, it um, something that I've also had to learn because we all had to pivot. And one of the things that we're doing here on the show is we're trying to um, get that um, that experience and uh, get that community aspect uh, going. I think it's so important for us to actually be sort of uh, bonded together and sharing experiences and being able to kind of um, you know just work together through the so important um you know one of the things that uh that i think is important as well is that you know um people just don't um realize what a, an opportunity this is as well i mean you know if you ever dreamed about just freezing the world uh, and just you know or just I, walking around we're yes. well god doesn't it feel like that it, it just feels like we all just we're going i couldn't agree more with that i found this to be you know I before this, um, there were two times of the year where I felt like I could really relax as an entertainer, and that was the week of Thanksgiving and the week, uh, the week people have the week or two people have off during Christmas and and Hanukkah in that time, and New Year's. So th those are the only, because I know that th that's the only time of the year that my peers, my entertainment peers, are not um, working. And we have the luxury to relax and, and hang out. So just kind of like what you're saying, these last two months have just been an opportunity to relax, A, but also, you know, take those projects and those things you always wanted to do off the shelf that have been that you had to put on the shelf that you didn't have time to do. Um, you know, me, I, I started taking guitar lessons again, uh, just, just online, learning how to use an electric guitar and 
Uh, I'm learning, you know, I'm just learning so many things. So it's been, it's been honestly a huge growing experience for me. So I'm actually really excited to, when we get to perform again, the skills that I'm going to bring back to the stage. You know what I mean? Oh, I can't wait. I mean, you, you've been on stage for a number of years now and you know, your popularity, popularity keeps growing and growing. And I've attended a couple of your shows and I have to say that one of the things that I really like about the way you actually perform is you bring the crowd in, you know, you're not just a show that you've repeated two or three times or many, many times. You're actually bringing everybody in. And um, it's kind of like wine, I think, you know, in, in a way wine is able to be um, experienced in different ways at different times. And, and you, you're kind of like wine yourself. You attract different things. And, and how do you do that? How do you go about, you know, how can you pair that experience? Well, I think if we pair it, if we pair it, first we want to pair it with a nice Sauvignon Blanc. Second, yes. we want, no, uh, you, you, uh, you know, as an entertainer, as an artist, growth is synonymous growth as a human is synonymous with growth as an artist, right? So just like wine gets better with age, you as an entertainer should get better with age. You should be evolving. You should be changing. You should be adding more tricks to your arsenal, more expanding your talent. Um, I think halfway through my comedy career, uh, when I started to pick it, when I picked up the guitar and added it to my act, a couple of years into that, I realized how much the audience appreciated being a part of the show. And if you look at a lot of the great comics, they don't ignore the they don't ignore the audience. You know, they they incorporate them, they acknowledge them, they'll break the fourth wall a little bit. Uh, and what's crazy about it that's that's kind of performance is rewarded even more on a platform like YouTube or. Instagram or Facebook, whatever it is, you know, people like when you talk to them, talk into the camera and they, they want to connect with you. They want to have a special moment with you. Even if you're talking to a hundred people, a thousand people, however many people it is, they want to connect with you. And so I've been kind of taking that, what I've learned in the live shows and, and, and bringing it over to the, these internet shows. Um, engaging with the chats. Um, I don't know if you've been on Zoom calls or Zoom meetings, but what's really fun about those shows is I can see everybody in the chat. So when I do my crowd work, I will pick somebody out and I'll, and I'll tell whoever's hosting, spotlight that person. And then I could do the crowd work with them. So it elevates the art form again. So I, I think... Um, also performing live. I forget. I forget the question. I feel like what happens? Is you ask me a question, then I just start fucking. Just no, like, actually, it's no. That's just start really, rambling. No, because know? you actually are doing exactly what everybody's doing right now. We're pivoting into different ideas and different, just different strategies, so that we can remain relevant and we can do right. our love to do. And you know, a lot of these actually in the next hour, we have um, Matthew Kanner, who is a very, very good entrepreneur, well known for Covell and other things that he's doing and done. And um, he's actually going to be talking about pivoting and how he has to re re reinvent himself and the bar and the whole psychology of it. Yeah. And he are doing pretty much the same thing. I mean, it seems to me we're all going to digital in the end, but it seems like it's we're going into digital and then we're going to go back out again some other form. You know, I don't know if it's once we get past COVID, if we're like you are, you, you've you actually learned new tools, but you've also been able to bring in new characters or you've had time to develop mm -hmm. new new circumstances for your, uh, for your routine. So it, this is the same for everybody. That's why this is so interesting. Yeah, you can't be afraid you know i think one of the keys to success is being able to pivot um being able to you know realize a goal or achieve a goal or change halfway through you know i i know a lot of comedians who when this started was like i'm not doing these i'm not going to do these online shows i'm not going to i'm not going to do these they're just, it's just not the same i'm not doing it and so in my head i'm like all right then don't do it but i think you're missing an opportunity because also I, I think this uh, this time is a time to experiment. So, and if something fails, then it doesn't matter because it, it wasn't a natural. It wasn't natural in the first place, right? So, if you're a stand-up comic and you're like, "Oh, this didn't go well," it's like, so what? You're not performing in the the stand-up comedy element. You know what I mean? Exactly. Just like experiment. 
I have a question. I mean, as an artist, have you been writing songs? You, I mean, how do you uh, how do you write? How do you find inspiration in dark times like these? Uh, so you got to be I, I think you got to be sensitive. Um, I wrote one song so far over this break. I wrote so I've written like 10 or 12 comedy sketches and then I, I wrote one song which is going to be released on Monday. I was actually going to release a music video on Monday, but uh, I don't. It does. I don't think it makes uh, sense to do that right now. So, but the song I wrote was in direct response to what was going on with with the quarantine, right? So, oh, I wish I brought my glass of wine. I should have poured one. But I think this is in direct response to. You know, I wrote this song called "Age Sex Location," and I could play a little bit of it for you in a little bit if you want. But essentially. That? Yeah, so essentially growing up, when I'm 33, so I grew up more or less in the 90s, early 2000s, um, the internet was a relatively new thing. And what would happen is you would log on to America Online, you'd go to a chat room, and you would type in the, the letters A slash S slash L, which stands for age, sex, location, because you would try to meet you know, people your own age. And I, I don't know what expectation as a teenager you have, but essentially that's what the song is about and just like kind of calling on nostalgia and it was a direct response to what was happening because I was doing all of these live all these live uh, streaming shows on the internet and I wanted a way for the crowd to feel like they were a part of the show so I would while I sang the song I'd be like all right guys go in the chat and I want you to let me know what your age sex location is let me know where you're from yada yada you know etc so that way they just had something to do that would be engaging at all you know it starts a conversation because it was just it's just a different medium you just have to adjust there's no there's no alternative to it you know i would i would love it if you could play it you want to play yeah yeah sure let me uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn my reverb on can you get can you hear that little ooh yeah oh yeah ooh. i have all these different effects check this out check this out yeah can you hear that how does that sound isn't that fun hey this is good shit i i love that i'm going to give an applause yeah, oh, there it is. We can't laugh. Yeah, I've got so we got different effects, voices, girl. and uh, we got different. We got the. We got the ooh, yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do. So we have all these different effects that I have with my <laughs> fun little machine. Um, so let me turn the reverb on. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and play this right. song. For you. you guys can't see it, but my guitar is right here. Uh, this is called Age. By the way, we are in my bedroom right now. I like to do this in my bedroom because. I want to bring you guys into my world. I want it to be intimate. You know, I want to make love. I want to make comedy love, musical love to you. That's great. Um, we're all part of this. Here we go. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. I should also point out that I know sometimes it sounds like I'm saying AIDS sex location, but it's very <laughs> difficult to say age over and over and over again. Okay? Sure. Just, I, I get it. <laughs> it all started in 1999. Had a thousand free hours of America online. Compact Presario and nothing but time. So I hit the chat room to see what I can find. Hey, what's up? I get a reply. Username is Skater Girl 1985. Clickety clack, we wasting no time, cause we already know what's on our mind. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, I'm 12. Sex, I am a man. New Jersey is where i am she like cool 14 i live there too and maybe one day i could meet you fast forward at the mall i sit here waiting my heart is pounding anticipating what will skater girl really look like will we fall in love will we smash tonight suddenly someone sits next to me they got a deep voice and say softly hold on check this out Hey, hold on. <laughs> so, hey, man. How do you do? <laughs> Turns out skater girl was a skater dude. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. 
Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Before I can speak, someone yells, freeze. Skater dude yells, oh my God, the police. Two men tackle him to the floor, screaming, you won't hurt children anymore. When everything was over, said and done, I went right back to where it all began. My mom was like, stay off the internet, but you know I had to log on again and again. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Age, sex, location. Girl, I want to know. I want to know how old are you? And what is your sex? And if you want some, and what is your location? Because I want to be where you are. Where you are. That is so that's just, just that's just a taste of that song. I love and thank you for premiering that here. I love that song. It's catchy as hell. You know, gotta, you do. Catch it. We want to make this the song of the summer, hopefully. Oh my god, it's so funny and it's also very, very uh, yeah. Ca it's catchy and it's got this beautiful rhythm, like when you did our intro. You know that music. Yeah. My kids are always sing that song now. You know. I don't know. Right. Hey, I, I actually have a question for you. You ever think about doing jingles? Of course I think about doing jingles. Oh, shit. Hey, <laughs> I have an idea. You okay. know, a lot of these uh, microbrewers, they're, you know, they're thinking about new marketing ideas and they're out there, you know, peddling. Yeah. As much as they sell, especially now, it's tough. Uh, how, about, how about we just come up with this? Um, let's call a local guy, like a local brewer. Okay. And let's, and let's try and get this... Uh, let's try and sell our jingle, your jingle, but you know, we'll, let's we'll, do it. Let's, see. No. let's give it a shot, dude. Let's I give it a shot. Let's do it right now. Is that okay, Morgan? Let's do it right now. Ready? Right. Let's, let's try I, it I'm out. Look for, I'm online right now and I'm going to look for a really freaking amazing brewer. Um, there's a few here in LA, as you know. Um, no, 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 no. Here's one, uh, uh, duck. Yeah, Venice Duck Brewery. Uh, this sounds like it's funny. I don't know if you've ever Venice had Duck it. Brewery. Venice Duck. Let's let's try. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for sure. Let's try and make up a jingle for this guy, and we'll call it. I'm gonna look for his number while you 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 come up with something. Quack quack quack. Find your flock. Find some friends and take off your socks. Whether it's a stoner dude, stoner duck. <laughs> look at that. You, you could also uh, think about that. Lucky duck, Venice donor duck. Okay, yeah. You, you want to try that? Yeah, yeah. Is he on the phone, or are we, are we doing it right now? We're just doing. I, it. You know what? I'm over here, and I found. I actually found him, so I can call him see if he if he answers. Let's do it. Right. What, what's the song we're gonna do? How does it sound? We're gonna do a uh, go. Get your friends and join the flock because right now it's beer o'clock. You're gonna be a lucky duck, so go ahead and say quack quack quack. Cause why the hell not? Venice Duck Brewery. That's it's it. All about the hops. Yeah, that's it. Venice Duck Brewery. I've heard of these guys. I mean, they they seem pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean. Let's see. Well, you can keep playing if you. Get your friends and join the flock if you didn't know. It's beer, it's Venice, it's beer, beer o'clock. Whether you're a lucky duck or a stoner duck, go ahead, go quack, 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 and say, oh. Why the hell not? All right. We got him. It's ringing. Can you hear it ring? Well, he, he, um, I left him a message. I'm wondering if I can actually get him um, okay. Us. I, I, that would be an amazing thing if we could. 
get him. But anyway, uh, I think that's oh, a good idea. Pick up? Did he not pick up? No, I, this guy didn't. I, I want to find more people to see if we can actually get them to, um, to, to pick, to, to, you know, just pitch these jingles. I think it would be such a good idea. You know, just say, hey, you know, this is Morgan J. And guess what? I got a jingle for your beer or for your whiskey or for your gin. And you just go on the riff. And who knows? Maybe you got to yeah. hit. What do you think? I think that's not a bad idea. Well, let's try. Let's try. Um, let's try one more thing here. Like, let's give this a shot. Uh, let me see uh, who we can find here. Find here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have you plugged in to my loop machine, so I could loop some. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Let's see if I can get. Is this who is this? His name is John Henry Binder. He's from Venice Duck Brewery. Let's see. Maybe he'll love this. I don't know. Oh, no. Okay. Well, definitely. Definitely. I don't think he's ready to. Well, I'll tell you what. You should. I'll, I'll sing it. We'll have it recorded and then we show it to him later. And we get his response, you know. Good idea. Let's do it. I'll just, I'll just sing it right now. All right, man. It's, uh, it's kind of similar to what we, basically what we just did. Get your friends and join the flock because right now it's beer o'clock. Kick off your shoes, you're a lucky duck. Quack, 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 why the hell, hell, hell not? That is Duck Brewery, it's all about the hops. I think it's a hit. I'm telling you, this is, this is the beer I want to drink with this song. It's great. Let me get the fattest duck beer in my mouth. I want to gobble it up like the devil. <laughs> hey, why don't you shoot like something higher? Uh, you know, you and I will, will actually practice this. I want to try Budweiser. You know, we'll, we'll try Miller's. I mean, what are these people doing anyway? You know, it's they don't have anything original. Yeah. Right? It'd be a shame. All right. So, um, uh, so I want to continue with some questions for you. What are you oh, drinking? Oh, sure. What do you what are you drinking normally? Like what do you um, what do you normally like to drink at home? You know, the last really so what I I'll tell you what the last really great drink I had as a matter of fact was a buddy of mine came over with a bottle of mezcal. Oh, it's good. Mezcal. Some nice smoky mezcal. And he just got a fresh grapefruit that he picked from a tree right in front of his house. And it was just it's a little bit of ice. Fresh squeezed grapefruit juice and a little bit of mezcal, and it was delicious. It went down really easy, um, so that was really good. Uh, another cocktail I do, I'll get like a Lacroix, and then I'll mix that with vodka, and I'll make like um, kind of like a caipirinha. I don't know if you don't, I don't know if you know what a caipirinha is, but brilliant, sure, love it. Well, caipirinha is made with cachaça, which is sugar cane, uh, and then you have a caipirosca which is the same thing except it's uh, vodka. So what we, ooh, let me turn the, 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 the reverb off. So what we do is we'll, we'll, take, um, we'll take vodka, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of lime juice, and then uh, LaCroix. And I guess you could use whatever flavor you want for the LaCroix, but it gives it like a nice little bubbly flavor and it's delicious. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good because... Because uh, caipirinha is something that I, I don't see a lot of people drinking out here. It's not something that's really. Um, they should. If they knew about it. What? If they knew about it, if they knew about it, they would be. But then again, it's a lot of sugar. I guess a lot of people are afraid of the sugar, you know. Right. Everybody's on the keto diet. Right. But, right. 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 So. Yeah. So that's why. Um, but uh, I like. Um, yeah, but that's I, I love that drink. I'm I, I think we should do that. And and these jingles are just amazing. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so the, another question I have is you know just before we go because uh, we're on the hour now we're gonna go and interview Matthew Canner next. Uh, I I wanted oh. to ask you um, wanted to ask you you've got a show also you could do, you have a very popular show actually that you do yourself. Uh, yeah, you know in in the yeah. last two months I I've grown my YouTube channel from like. You know, set, I'm I'm a little over five thousand subscribers now, and we're just slowly building it. Um, first of all, I have uh, my comedy special, which is on my YouTube channel, which you could watch in its entirety. Yeah. Um, and then I do a live stream show every once in a while on my. Oh, oh. who's that? Oh, so hold on a second. Hold on a sec. Hi, 
Oh, so <laughs> so sorry to bug you. Are you uh, are you yeah. John? Are you John? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, John, you're the owner of uh, Venice Duck Brewery, right? Uh, <laughs> yep, I, I am. Oh, so sorry, man. Look, I, I I apologize. I found your number. It was online, really. And I um. And we want to actually, my name's Bertie, I'm with Some Table, and I've got Morgan J. We're locals, actually. I don't know if you've heard of Morgan. He's all over the place here in Venice, your hometown. So, uh, what's up, John? Yeah, so, how are can you hear me, John? Sorry to bug you, yeah, but I can hear you. We, we want to call it, we, want to, we wanted to ask you something. You know, you've got a very, very popular a beer, Venice Duck, Venice Duck Brewery. And have you ever considered, have you ever, we want to pitch something. Have you ever considered a really cool jingle for your beer? Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Why not? Why I've not? considered a lot of things. Yeah. Well, listen, we we <laughs> we just came up with one, like right now. Morgan, yeah, we'll just around. I yeah. just got no. one for you. Do you want, do you want to hear it? Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Sure. <clears throat> Grab some friends and join the flock, cause right now it's beer o'clock. Quack quack quack. Maybe you're a stone or duck. Either way, you are one lucky. Ooh, have a good glass of beer with Venice Duck Brewery. It's all about the hops. We're just messing around. We're having fun, you know. I love, I love it. That was awesome. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. You, we we just came up with that one, and we have others if you want. I mean, this is. Yeah, I just came up with that. That was that was twenty seconds of just me thinking about something. You know, it, if I had more time. I could. I can. We could do. We can get you something as good as uh, the what that that carpet cleaner one. You know what I'm talking about. John, what's what, what the carpet cleaner? Yes, you know? <laughs> which one's that one? I forgot. I, I can't remember how it goes, but I know they had like one of the most the biggest jingles of all time. But wait, sure. can you tell us a story of how you you came up with that name, uh, Venice Duck Brewery, uh, John? You... Yeah, well, we had a uh, a buddy of ours. Uh, me and my partner were both bartenders, and a buddy of ours was a bartender. And uh, one night, he uh, after his bar shift in Venice. He was in the canals in that area, and it was probably sometime in, in the winter. And uh, he stumbled back out of the party he was at at probably like four or five in the morning. And he kind of curled up on like a little bench there or something and fell asleep. And when he woke up, there were all these ducks like embedded on him, a family of ducks. And uh, they must have been on him for warmth or whatever. But uh, he sort of, you know, so startled. The ducks were startled. And. I don't know that story. We told that story for years, and it was just you know I don't know. It inspired us to uh, make a beer. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Was it by was it by that area in the canals where they have all the ducks? I'm assuming it's by that little duck area. Yeah, there, there's always these families of ducks. That's right. kind of the inspiration. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's where that story comes from. I, I had, but wait, now I now I remember you 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 were you were also at James Beach and how. Yep. You were bartender yep. of the year. Yep. Okay. That's where you were bar, barman of the year in uh, in the U.S. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, I, 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 years ago, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen. I, I have to tell you. With that said, what do you think, Morgan? Is there another um, another song you think we could come up with? I mean, there's something about like I'm a, there's there, you have three types of ducks. You have the lucky duck, the stoner duck, and what's the other duck? The Dogtown. The Dogtown duck. All right. Whether, okay, hold on one second. Whether you're a stoner duck or a lucky duck or a duck town duck, say what the fuck and just have something to drink right now. Venice Duck Brewery, it's all about the hops. Yeah, that's well done, my friend. <laughs> we're just messing around with it. Yeah, we're just messing around with it. Ah, oh, cool. Man. John, yeah. I I think we got something viral going on here, you know, besides everything else going on. But this song, don't you think? I definitely do. No, I'm totally impressed. I'm going to come it. through and have a, have a beer with y'all and, and taste this beer. I, yeah, I I, I'll get you some of that for sure. Yeah. Well, John, I have to tell you, I really appreciate you being on the show today. We called you randomly. And uh, uh, <laughs> I have to tell you, you've been a great participant. We'll send you a check. Or actually, no, you'll send us a check for the jingle. <laughs> Yeah. So it's pro bono, but I'll come up with some other jingles. <laughs> oh man, I, I was that was fun. I was unexpected. Thank you guys. All right, thanks, John. Nice to meet you. Okay, Bye. take care. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Bye. Bye.
cool. Anyway, I have to tell you something. That was uh, that was that was nice to laugh a little bit. It's like John is still with us. Yeah, I'm trying to learn how to get away. That's okay. You can stay on if you want. Uh, but anyway, here it is. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for being on the show today. Like I mentioned, we do have Matthew Canner next, and um, I want to thank Morgan J. Morgan, it's always a pleasure to be Thanks here. Thanks so much for having me. I think that, don't you have a show next? Yeah, so in about, at six o'clock, I don't know, when when, did, when does this air? Is it, is it now? It's now. I, I think oh. it's, and I haven't pressed play, so I... <laughs> so, you, so, you, so this is live right now? It looks like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, I have my own live stream show, and it will be, even if you see this later, uh, my show, it's on my YouTube channel. It's going to be at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and normally I sing funny songs, we do some funny games, and we just sort of hang out. Uh, but given the political cl- climate of the, co- of the country, I think we could all be doing more and educating ourselves and things like that. So uh, we're just going to be kind of talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm going to be showing you uh, text messages and phone calls from complete strangers who have reached out to me, just sort of telling me how they feel about what's going on in their towns and lives. And then from there, uh, we are um, just going to continue the discussion. That's about it. Well, Morgan, I, I agree with you. I, um, I not only second that, but I think it, I applaud you for, for that and everything everybody's out there doing. We're going through some really tough times. Like I said, I applaud everybody that is um, fundraising, that is protesting, <clears throat> That is uh, putting up, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, wood things on the windows or taking them down, whatever you're doing. Yeah. A lot of everybody for that. And, um, and I really think that we'll get through this. I think there'll be better days. It's something that unfortunately happened. Uh, maybe it had to happen. It's been happening every day for so many, so many years. Uh, I mean, I was, I remember 92 with Rodney King and we still have any changes since so maybe this is the, the time the moment maybe COVID even opened the door for us to really take um, stock of everything and to really make a significant change on everything so right, right. I want to thank you um, I want to uh, just so everybody knows I was right now I've been with Morgan J Morgan J is from New York he uh, he's here in LA he's got a great show um, and also I, I, I urge everybody to follow Morgan J and his channel it is absolutely hilarious I wanted Morgan to bring some light to everything that's happening and for that I I, I thank you Jay I appreciate it thank you so much Bertie I appreciate it uh, guys enjoy the rest of your week you know keep educating yourselves and I'll see you guys next time got it man up next Bye, guys we have um, Matthew Canner, and Matthew is up, and he'll be telling us everything that's going on as from the point of view of a somebody, from the point of view of an entrepreneur, from the point of view of somebody who owns various businesses, and how he's pivoting and how he's able to circumnavigate everything that's going on. So up next, we have Matthew Canner. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Bertie. I'm with Some Table, and you're watching Vinely Live. Today we have a great guest. Uh, today we're meeting Matthew Kanner, uh, the co-founder and the, the director, and of course, so many, uh, hence why he's here today. I want to give you a little uh, background on Matthew. It's very interesting. He began his career with Cask Wine Store in Santa Barbara, California. He then moved to Los Angeles in 2006, where he was given an opportunity to work with Silver Lake Wine. Now, in 2009, a close friend of his, Dustin Lancaster, and himself, they opened in Los Felices a, a bar called Covell. You may have heard of it. It, uh, it. It's actually a bar concept that everybody's been talking about, and I'm very, very interested in uh, speaking to Matt about this today. He was named So Many of the Year by Food and Wine magazine in 2013. And in 2015, um, Lancaster and a new partner called David Gibbs and the trio, they opened up uh, Augustine, a wine bar in Sherman Oaks. Augustine itself was named Best Wine Bar of America by Food and Wine Magazine. Another great accomplishment by Matt. Uh, last year, along with two co-founders, Josh Onstad and uh, Michael Curtis, um, they launched a subscription wine club, a great uh, wine subscription wine club called Solovan. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Solovan, um, which brings basically the so many experience in small production and small production wine batches to directly to the consumer something that we'll talk about. 
Last but not least, in 2019, uh, Wine Enthusiast Magazine named Matthew uh, in the 40 under 40 tastemakers lists of 2019. So uh, again, like one accomplishment after another. Matt, uh, uh, incredible. Uh, it's like you were born to make to, to do this. <laughs> so welcome to finally. It's so good to have you. Matt, Thank you for having me. It, it, say a little bit about yourself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a couple questions, but what, what have you been up to during this whole pandemic thing going on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we had to close the wine bars to the public on the 15th of March. And that was a kind of crazy experience, as you can imagine. It's one thing when you have to close a business because the sales are poor and they don't do well. And, you know, you got to close up shop and lay everyone off and, you know, literally close. But when the government mandates a shutdown, it's a whole different experience, a whole different psyche, something that had never happened in my lifetime before. So I went into... Um, self-imposed quarantine like all of us did and you know i've been at home i was home alone for the first like four weeks just cooking three times a day walking the silver lake reservoir daily which i live right above it so it's nice to have that close and then uh drinking a lot of beer i'll be honest with you i was drinking way too much fucking beer <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad thing is it <laughs> well I, I love beer you can you can probably t i'll show you a little bit i'll move over but i have some of the remnants of my beer purchases <laughs> still sitting on one of my wine fridges, like Pliny the Elder and Society Brewing Company and Kern River. And, you know, their tap rooms are all closed, so they're just selling direct to people at their homes now, and that's special. So I wanted to support. Um, but then things picked up in April, and uh, kind of like what we're doing here, you know, the, the rise of Zoom tastings and webinars and Instagram Live started to pick up, and people were able to, because they were home, because there's a captive audience – to use kind of a, uh, a new mindset to adjust. And I got asked to be a part of a lot of things, which helped me get out of my own funk, to be honest with you. Yes. So I'm thankful for that kind of help out to dig out of the, the self mire and the, you know, it's, it's despair. It's, it's unfortunate because everyone's dealing with this differently. And in my career, the last time I took more than like one or two days off back to back was probably a decade ago. Yeah. So to take a full month to myself and just reflect and sit back and you know have no agenda, I'm thankful. I don't like why, but I'm thankful for that moment and for that ability. So um, you know, I'll always reflect back on that. But now we're in uh, May of 2020, coming up on June of 2020, and we've reopened my flagship wine bar, Covell, as a wine store. Awesome. So two weeks ago, <laughs> thankfully, we reconcepted reevaluated and got it back open as a pickup and delivery only wine store. And so I worked tirelessly with my business partner, with our director of operations, and we hired back one employee to get our inventory on the website. So for the first time ever, Covell, which for those who know, Covell had 150 wines by the glass and no wine list, no wine list, no primary source document, no fucking manuscript to read. It was an experience. It that was, was a conversation. Uh, right. That was the whole thing. Now we're a wine store and you can go on our website and we have, you know, a hundred wines available by the bottle. So um, we're adapting, we're adjusting, we're having to get over it in our own heads, what Covell is. And right. really at this point, it's all about adapting to the world around us. And um, I'm feeling hopeful for the future, but there's going to be a lot of changes. There's going to be things that we probably will never go back to in the, the habits that we had in certain wine bar contexts and hospitality. So, I lament the things that are lost, but I'm also hopeful for the adjustment in the future. We're going to go in there and talk about that specifically uh, because there's a lot of interesting points there. But you're right. It's almost like this big, humongous reset button just fell on top of us. And now we're like, what's happening? Maybe it's a blessing. Maybe it's not. We don't know. But it's uh, certainly something of a challenge. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, Time will tell. But Time will tell. And it's interesting what's going to happen in 20 years, how we'll see what we did, if we did it right or we did it wrong. Yeah. But hey, I want to take uh, our viewers back a few years um, because uh, I, I know you started in um, uh, basically the wine business you know, from a wine store, which is funny enough how yeah. it's coming full circle. Now you're, yeah. you're kind of in a wine store again. But um, you've been extremely versatile. I mean, that's one of the key uh, success uh, point of your of your career the fact that you're versatile and you can you can turn very quickly from one I don't know from one not a crisis but from one situation to another and mold yourself and adapt right adaptability is really the key for everything and you're able to grow and be successful hence you know a lot of the things that you've done with passion and everything 
So uh, my question is, you know, uh, Barcovel being what it was, was and still is extremely successful, how did you, what made you like during this time sit down and say, I got to pivot, I now got to do something else, I have to think outside of the box, which I did when I started this new concept, which was really to be, you know, something different, something completely outside of the box anyway, and I'll do it again. Yeah. How did you get into that frame of mind? Well, when we first were closed for about five or six days after, I personally was doing concierge pickup and deliveries for both Augustine Wine Bar and Sherman Oaks, you mentioned, which I'm a co-founder of. And until March of 2020, uh, I was an owner. I'm no longer an owner of the business oh. and Covell. So in the first like seven days after the whole shutdown happened and we let all of our staff go, I realized, you know, people do want to support and it's great, but there was so much unknown. And we didn't know how the virus was spreading, really. We didn't know if touching a bottle of wine meant we can get sick. We didn't know if everyone was going to be okay wearing masks and having hand sanitizer coming out of every orifice. And, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. All of a sudden, you have to adjust like a snap of fingers, right? right. So I, I personally didn't so, think it was worth it to put myself at risk. Like, so we exactly stopped that. And, and then and we let weeks the later, go, um, the government, you know, they passed the CARES Act, which had a lot of things for individuals, monetary help. But also some um, some payroll protection, the payroll protection plan loans, mm -hmm. and thankfully Covell and then all of my business partner Dustin Lancaster's businesses that applied were able to be given a PPP loan. So that moment became really pivotal. That we then were on the clock to either use the money for the forgiveness ability, or really reconcept and be smart about how you use that money to the business's advantage because. Paying rent is going to continue to be a really challenge, uh, challenging thing in the future. Um, our rent is built to be a $1.5 million business, not to be a wine store that's open five days a week for five hours a day. Exactly. So we got to figure out how to best use those funds. But the pivot made sense because we wanted to stimulate some sort of um, – we wanted to get people back to work somehow. And it's not a lot right now, but we're hoping that it builds to be able to bring more people back. And it also made sense given um, – Early in, in May, it, it was pretty clear to us that Los Angeles County is not going to open up just back the way it was for a while. We don't believe until August or so that they'll allow dine-in to happen again in L.A. proper. And so because of that, that meant we had three more months to figure out how to do some sort of commerce. And wine is a big-time asset. Uh, thankfully, if you keep it in a temperature-controlled room, it doesn't go bad. But it also costs money. Able to not only make people happy, but to be able to use our assets. And so with my experience, I was able then to go back, uh, from, you know, my past retail experiences, we were able to quickly reconcept and kind of um, get the store, get the doors back open in a virtual sense quickly. Now, I know you don't do... Um Okay, so Matt, the other thing that, that's interesting, and I know this was the concept behind Covell, was to have 150 or more different types of wines available by the glass, which is an incredible feat on its own. But now, you know, you're doing something which is going to, because of everything that's going on, um, it's going to change, obviously, again. So my question is, and you may remember, you and I were introduced by Rita Nabeiru, the winemaker from Adega Mayotte and you know here we're talking about these classic old world wines versus now these new world wines which are closer and perhaps even um, uh, perhaps themselves are going through growth themselves and and variety and and taste and everything into different types of um, yeah into a different types of approaches how is that relationship going to change are you going to change your menus which you don't have any but are you going to change the concept to adapt to a localized inventory or are you still going to go worldwide old and new world? It's a great question. And so what I can tell you is that before any of this happened, California wines, and I, I don't want to just say California, but the bulk of it is California. So American wines and encapsulation of Washington state, Oregon, New York state, Virginia, Texas, Michigan, Missouri at all, any of the states that we represent, Pennsylvania, Vermont, there's not a lot, but there's a few uh, outside of California that make that high quality stuff that we're inspired to, to work with. California, though, represents about 30% of what we sell in, before March 15th, 2020. Right. Now, we're not looking necessarily to change exactly the breakdown of what we sell, but we are going to have to trim back our inventory because 
I used to be able to spend a lot of money per week for new wines. And thankfully we sold a lot of wine so we could always justify the expenditure. But now, you know, if they're going to limit our capacity by 20 or 40, you know, however many percent, uh, it looks like we'll probably be able to open to dine in with 25 or 50 percent of the capacity you used to allow. So that's a limitation of 50 or 75 percent less. There's no way you're going to be able to have the same amount of inventory. It's impossible. Right. So the wine store interim, this little in-between period, allows for us to sell off great wine at a, a very remarkable price. I mean, it's all retail. It's I looked up wine.com, Wine Searcher, my favorite wine stores in LA. If they had the same wine or if the winery itself was selling it direct on their website, I price it the same as everyone else because that's the only fair way to do it when it's online. The thing about the economics of a wine bar is you're paying for the service, the hospitality, the seat, the fact that someone's going to bring you a glass and tell you about the wine. Someone else is going to clean the glass. Someone else is going to clean up your crumbs when your cheese plate's right. done. So when you don't have that sort of experience, you just can't also have the price tag with that. So um, it's a totally different thing. And though you know, I'm, I'm a fan of wines from all over the world. My first love was the Northern Rhone Valley and also Burgundy. I realized quickly it was hard to uh, afford those wines daily. So I've kind of changed my habits. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, people like uh, Rita and her family in, um, in Alentejo and, you know, my, my friends in Vino Verde and up in the Douro and my friends in Pajara and all these great regions, I will continue to tell their stories because I love what they do. We're just going to have to be a little bit more specific about how we do it in this new mindset. So what it looks like will happen, and I'm not going on record and saying this is what will happen, but this is kind of the mindset that we're playing with. We have some time still. I believe we're going to do a concept within a concept called Curated by Covell, which will be a new mindset of this kind of yeah. new world adjustment period, whatever it's going to be. And we'll probably whittle it down to more like 40 or 50 wines that will be available monthly. And maybe they'll have a commonality. Maybe they'll all be from one region or one country. Maybe um, we'll just say fuck it and do anything from anywhere. I don't yep. know what exactly what, but the 150 that we had will definitely be truncated down just because we can't in, in the kind of – the mindset you have to have in business is you're forecasting, right? right? And the current information we have, you can't forecast at all. There's right. nothing you can forecast for except for chaos. <laughs> and that's absolutely no way to make a business plan. So um, we're trying to come up with ways that we'll, we'll still have people be familiar with the Covell experience, but also allow for us to pivot, adjust, change, given the fact we have no fucking clue what happens next. And it's interesting because this actually gave way to a new business idea, a new business um, vertical that you weren't really expecting. You, I mean, you probably wouldn't have really done this if it didn't have uh, if this didn't happen, right? Or would you? Maybe you would have. I'm not sure. So there, there's been some kind of um, desire, I should say, in my life to work a normal work schedule. I forget what that's like. Um, <laughs> You know, I usually work anywhere from 60 to 70 hours a week, depending on what's going on. And I'm not behind a bar that much, but you know, it's like you wake up at 7.30, you're working by 8.39, your day ends at 10 p.m. It's just a common thing. It's what happens in this world. And it's right. seven days a week, you know, to take a day off is rare in my world. So yeah, I've been trying to kind of trim back my responsibility levels and also think of the future because I want to have a family. I want to have a wife. I want to have kids. I want these things. Exactly. And it's going to be hard to do that in the world I currently allow myself to exist. So having a wine store has been something that's definitely come up in my mind. But another segue, which I know you want to talk about anyway, which is the concept of this wine uh, wine club that we Sullivan. brought up, yep. Sullivan. Um, there's talk of that down the road becoming an actual location with a store and with more of a community behind it. But when this whole pandemic hit, Sullivan actually kind of got put on pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. And... When we reopened Covell, we realized it was actually a great opportunity to think outside the box, literally, right. think outside the Sullivan box. And um, instead of doing the three bottles a month for 80 bucks, which was what we had been doing for the last year, we're now doing a new subscription base where it's going to cost $50 a month, 50 bucks per mm -hmm. month for your subscription. What that subscription will do is when you get charged, you'll get an email and it will unlock your ability to pick one of our themed boxes that we'll have available and there will be many options each month. So 
Um, that fifty dollars will be basically a credit that you'll get to then put forward to to choose which box you want. Maybe one month you want all rosés, one month you want all sparkling, one month you want French only, one month you want Italian, one month you want all orange wines. We fucking got you. We're gonna nail this for you, and it's gonna be a way for not only that. So you can choose that way, but you can add another box if maybe one other one inspires you and you can't pick. Yeah, there'll be a way for people to um, to you know for I don't like ter- using the term upsell, but there'll be a way for added sales. And another thing, share too, it if, or as a gift, again, you could share yeah. it or give it or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. And then um, another great part is like let's say someone's on a budget and the fifty dollars a month was a little too much for them. Maybe um, we're going to have some boxes that are priced less than fifty dollars as well. That 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 difference, that ten dollar difference, because I think the lowest will be forty. That ten dollars will go forward and be a credit for your next month. So you're not going to lose money. You're not going to, you know, we'll be mindful of the fact that also budgets are changing. The thing we learned the most was that our audience was smaller at eighty dollars a month. It just wasn't as big as we were hoping. So we're gonna try to bring it back a little bit, open up the world. And what's great about this is, uh, as soon as the idea happened, we put up on the Covell website six different box ideas that are under the Covell Wine Club three pack boxes on our website. If you guys go to barcovell.com and the order online tab, and in the four or five days of service we've had to sell these boxes, I think I've sold something like twenty or twenty five of them. That's so it's amazing. really, really encouraging. It's working. And you know what's interesting is you're going to go into this uh, niche, or if you will call it a niche. It's not a niche. But you know, when you go to wine.com and you're looking for wine that's not in the bottle, let's just say you want a bag and box or let's just say you want it in the can because, man, I've been seeing some amazing wines in the can like Ramona's and all these different ones that are out there right now. And uh, you're going to be able to bring that into the fold, right? I mean, it's not just a bottle of wines. Would you consider other sizes, other kind of, you know, other kinds of brands like that? So we've got ideas for doing things like a curated box, like a cheese night, where it's, you know, like a bottle of Jura wine and then uh, a pack to do reclet. Or do an or, you know, things like that. So yeah, we could we could definitely talk about doing like, I have good friends that have Nomadica, amazing canned wine. We have, I'm um, friends with Jordan who has Ramona and that's delicious. Yes. We are definitely open to other great things like that. And What's funny about this whole kind of reset, as you called it, and you're totally right about that, I used to think I knew a lot. Now I don't know a fucking thing. I'm <laughs> open to any idea that right. makes sense that people want. I'm here to do humbly what I believe. I probably should have had a more open mindset before. But also, like when you have a wine bar that people go to, you're not open to changing because you don't have to, right? Exactly. Yes. So yeah. what's actually crazy about this whole thing is Covell and even Augustine have been licensed the whole time to sell a bottle of wine to go. We could have been doing this all along. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it took a, no, a novel coronavirus to have us do it. But amazing that you, you hit the ground running with this whole thing. It just seems like you guys were, you had it in you. You didn't know it at the time, but it just took this whole thing to happen to actually realize you had it available for you. And I think it's gonna be great. Uh, I have a question. I, I'm sorry to throw this on you yeah. like this because it's a, I can't get this answer from anybody. There's a huge glut of, of grapes out there. I don't know if you know, but they're asking us to yeah. tell 5%, 10% production. And and that's a huge, not only in the US, all over the world. For, so 2019, we're going to be okay. I think prices are really going to go down in a lot of production now. But for 2020 in this harvest, what do you think is going to happen? What, you know, you're so cutting I back. Was... Yeah, I mean, you're cutting back. Uh, restaurants are cutting back. Nobody's buying. Really. I mean, we're buying online, but where's all this glut going? I was set to give um, what was going to be a kind of uh, a negative wine seminar. I hate to say it that way, but it's a big wine conference in Paso Robles that happens, the Central Coast Wine Conference or something like that. I forget the actual title now, but it was me- it was meant to be on the 24th of March. And they had me from the retail side. They had a guy who was representing the kind of vineyards and, and agricultural side. And all of us were coming back to the same thing. They wanted to talk about you know the state of the business. And from his perspective, he kept saying, there's so many vineyards that no one's going to source from and the fruit prices are going to go down. Everyone kept planting as many vineyards and as many vineyards, as many vineyards as possible. And unfortunately, what happened is you reach this, um, you know, kind of max, you're you're maxed out on the ground you can put grapes in and there's no one to buy it. So what does that mean? That means there's a bunch of fruit that someone's being paid to farm that there's no market for. And especially if there's 
wineries who have to produce less wine and there's less retail partners to sell through, ultimately what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, bank right. loans are going to get defaulted on. Um, leases are going to get broken. And I think ultimately the rise of the home winemaker might come back truly. I mean, that, that's very possible. Yeah. Come and farm the grapes yourself and grow them yourself. Maybe we're going to, maybe, what do you call it when you, 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 you sell plots in your farm, you know, whatever that means, but maybe we're uh, gonna like, a go back. like sharecropping almost sharecropping, you know, where people go yeah. back to the land and on the weekends they grow their own. Who knows? That might be uh, yeah. that's a good idea. Uh, but I tell you, I, I, this is the big old equalizer. I have to tell you, it's like, it's been, it's been flattening everybody. We are all in the same starting gate as everybody else. And, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I love it to be honest, honest with you, because I'm seeing some some great potential, great opportunities. Of course, I'm seeing a lot of hardship, obviously, which nobody wants. Yeah. But so, um, so, uh, so let's just fast forward to 20 years. And it's, this is kind of like an unfair question, but 20 years from now, <laughs> let's just say, you know, you made the right moves. Everything was exactly what you should have done during this crisis. What do you think that picture looks like in, in your view? Things that you've done, you did it right, and fast yeah. forward. 20 years from now, I truly believe that I will probably have done more media stuff, more TV or more online platform style um, media projects, whether it be on location or interview style. This is something that I've personally wanted to move into and I've been honing in that craft and trying to get better at it and you know, flexing the muscle at it. Yeah, I want to also be able to have residents all over the world. I want to have apartments in all the cities that have inspired me that I've traveled to. Yeah. So I'd like to live throughout the year in places like Porto or in Lisboa or in Barcelona or in Vienna or in Adelaide Hills or in Cape, Cape Town, Franch Hook or in Uruguay, you know, Montevideo or Jose Ignacio or whether it be Chiloé Island in Chile or Santiago. <laughs> you know, I want to live anywhere and everywhere and I want to have the means to do so. And honestly, my biggest thing, I, I do want to live on a vineyard and have, I want to grow grapes and make wine. I'll keep it small and keep it humble. I have a small wine brand I've been making since 2007. And really? I think I have to, I got to think forward to something else that okay. AMFM will not be the end all be all for that. So mm -hmm. I want to have my own production, my own vineyard. But um, truly, I've been for the last couple of years trying to, within myself, transition into the more mentor role. So the kind of things that I would like to be able to do are take online kind of webinar things like this one-on-one -on -one with people, answer their questions, help them find their footing, how they can entry into the wine world. I actually had a conversation like this today at like 1230, a, a guy reached out to me and asked, how do I get into wine? And I did a half an hour uh, seminar with him. And, you know, I, I believe that that could be helpful. Whether my opinion means anything to anyone, it's not up for me to say, but yeah. if I can inspire people to find their path. That mentorship is something I've been lucky to have from many people throughout my career, and I know how important it can be. So I'm trying to kind of go into that more sociable mindset. How can I give back? How can I help mold people in the industry? And, you know, it's – there's a custodian nature to this. And since I don't have, like, family vineyards for generation, I don't have that custodial nature. But I'm trying to figure out how to help people find their footing within the industry. That's something I can do. Well, that's – Th those are great uh, words, and not only that, I mean, that is so on point with what you do, and it's um, it's very clear when you did Covell that you were able to get your staff to actually, you know, forget the menu, not show any of that, but really have a conversation with the client, and to have a conversation with the client, get kind of a tone of what it is that they're like, and what, you know, you could ask them, hey, who's your favorite movie actor, and automatically know, okay, well, if you're, if you're a happy person, then this is a wine for you, or whatever, but you're able yeah. to... That, I mean, and it was so difficult to get the staff to make this happen in a uh, in a real world scenario where you actually have to pour the wine and not lose money in the back end and all that. But now you're right. going to, have to do it again on the on the on the on the digital side, and you're consulting people on that. So uh, really, I mean, th that's your next challenge. So the custodial side is really coming through, and I can see that. Thank you. I you know it's. The, the best analogy I can make, it's kind of the same time I've pivoted away from ownership in my, my business life. What I realize is our lives are not like a sailboat. You don't just move the sail and all of a sudden you're going west. Right. It's more like a barge. You know, This is um, a freight tanker coming from China or Korea loaded with weights and pounds and so many different things that are going to go into port and be sold. 
And to move that wheel a degree takes time and takes yes. patience and takes foresight. So there's a life philosophy that I really want to share. And I think it's very important. This is something that I'll probably end up writing a book about or doing a webinar about. But I feel like in, uh, in the world today, especially in American life, but especially in the modern world, we're very shark-like. We see something, we go after it. You know, you set your sights on something, whether it be, I know I'm going to have this job or I know I want this girl or this man as my boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife or whatever. Um, you see things that you desire and the, the kind of immediate response is attack, 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 get it, take yeah. it. It's mine. Yeah. The problem with that mentality is sometimes what you saw was actually a stone and you hit your nose and break your teeth and your nose is you know, bleeding and then another animal comes and eats you because it tastes your blood or, you know, uh, you eat a, uh, something else that was contaminated and then you have a stomach problem and then you die of stomach cancer. Yeah. I, you know, I'm talking in shark terms, so I don't exactly know all the things sharks <laughs> go through, but a lot of times because of their poor eyesight and because they think they know what they're seeing, they go zero to 60 at something and they miss 95% of the time. So not all of us. Yeah, not all of us have a 5% success rate. Some of us have like a 0.05% success rate. So what, what I'm trying to get people to do is be less shark-like mm -hmm. and be more like a jellyfish. A jellyfish gets carried by the current, yeah. it pulses, you know, it experiences along the way. It gets carried into experiences it would not otherwise have if it was more shark-like in its approach. And so I'm not saying stop being like a shark. I'm saying be less like a shark and be more open to being carried by the world, by the tides, whatever experience you might think is, uh, is out there for you. If you're more open-minded, the path that you walk down can be paved by people you never knew existed. Experiences are right there around the corner waiting for you if you allow them to happen. And so that's a really, for me, that's an important life philosophy that I've come up with. I'm starting to develop. And I really want to be able to share that with people because I think in America, we're so specific at, well, my, my parents told me to be a doctor, so I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to have a kid by 35, I'll have the picket fence a day later, and I know exactly what I want and I'm going to get it and it's mine. And that's not how it works for everyone. It's not. Be careful what you wish for. That's always been the case. You know, a lot of people think, you know, the white picket fences, uh, that's it in the end of be all. But it's not. I mean, you know, I'm one to tell. I, I, I love that life, but it's not mine anymore. And, you know, and now you, you really have to kind of do what you're saying. You have to philosophize this a little bit and realize that really the happiness is in things like you were saying, traveling, like being like that jellyfish, you know, crossing the ocean slowly and taking in all the beautiful and not so beautiful things that life throws at you. So absolutely. I love the fact that you're able to bring this philosophy, this, this uh, DNA into everything you do, Matt. I mean, it's really incredible. Really. Thank you. Fun. Really. Um, so I'm going to ask you this one word, which I ask everybody else, Matt, and it's uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, but can you define this and everything else we talked about the world of wine in one word, and then kind of tell me a little bit, if you don't mind why you chose that word. Community. It's for me, it's simple. It's community. It's the fact that it takes a village of people to create wine. It takes a village of people to move it from its creation to a new home. It takes a village of people to sell it to others. It takes a village of people to communicate what that is to people. So it's not just alcohol in a glass, truly. This is a description of so many different people's monetary choices, investments, um, being an heir to a family heirloom and being given vineyards, custodians, nature, as we talked about earlier. So that community for me is something that's very important and has directed my way of existing in the wine world. I no longer think about it as me and them. It's we're together. It's all together. It's interlinked. And so wine for me is gastronomic, very much so. It goes with food. We in America, unlike a lot of European countries, use it as cocktail it's not quite how it goes in Europe. You know, it's always with a meal, but um, we're trying our best to learn better or maybe more applicable applications. And the only way to do that is to bond as a community and have these conversations. So for me, community is that's, that's where I start. That's for me, the end all. One word, community. So everybody remember that. And uh, I tell you this brief, uh, voyage we had with you this this incredible experience we had with with you i cannot wait to come back 
and ask you a few more questions a few months later, if you don't mind, because where you're going with this, uh, it, this is exactly what people need to know and they need to be on top of. So, man, I, I really appreciate you being here with us. Yeah, it's my this pleasure. Time, your, your love, your passion and this this being that you are and uh, so I really appreciate it and with that I want to say thank you and I hope you'll come back soon. My pleasure. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.